Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of The Lost Worlds of 2001 by Arthur C. Clarke. The ultimate book of the ultimate trip, 2001, A Space Odyssey. So as always, I'm going to read you the blurb, I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads... Published by Sedgwick and Jackson in association with New English Library. I don't think that's part of the blurb, but hey-ho, you're getting it now. The ultimate trip started with a story called The Sentinel by Arthur C. Clarke. It took flight when Stanley Kubrick asked Clarke to write a novel of space exploration. The result was one of the most extraordinary films of all time. Now, for the first time, the reader has taken on every stage of this great adventure. Here is the original story and the interplay between two brilliantly charged imaginations. This is Arthur C. Clarke's own intimate account of the unique chemistry between author and director which created 2001 A Space Odyssey. And I just thought this was almost prophetic because this is kind of what SpaceX is working on now, the idea of like reusable rockets. The brief age of the rocket dinosaurs, each capable of but a single flight, was drawing to its close. Instead of the thousand ton boosters whose bones now littered the Atlantic deeps, men were building far more efficient aerospace planes, giant rocket aircraft which could climb up to orbit with their cargoes, then return to Earth for another mission. Commercial space flight had not yet been achieved, but it was on the horizon. I would say that's pretty much where we are now. I mean, I guess you do kind of have commercial space flight just about in terms of like space tourism. And um, NASA was spending the entire budget of the movie over $10 million every day. We have a great entertaining little footnote here. It says, I once accused my friends in MGM's publicity department of having a special labor saving key on their typewriters, which when pressed automatically began to print out never in the history of motion pictures. Marketing hasn't changed. Uh, we get some excerpts from his diary as well. So he says on September the 26th, Stanley gave me Joseph Campbell's an analysis of the myth, the hero with a thousand faces to study. Very stimulating. That's still being um, taught a lot at the moment. And on November 20th, he says, back at the Chelsea, phoned Ike Asimov to discuss the biochemistry of turning vegetarians into carnivores. Ike Asimov being Isaac Asimov. I love that he calls him Ike. And I thought this was cool as well, because Burroughs and Ginsburg are favourite writers of mine. December 21st, much of afternoon spent by Stanley planning his Academy Award campaign for Dr. Strangelove. I get back to the Chelsea to find a note from Alan Ginsburg asking me to join him and William Burroughs at the bar downstairs. Do so thankfully in search of inspiration. We get a reference to him visiting a private zoo near Nuneaton, which is uh, it's where my grandparents are from, so I've spent a lot of time in Nuneaton. So we learn about the aliens, the kind of the people who are behind the mysterious obelisks. Um, obviously didn't and end up making it into the final movie, but um, uh, in the five centuries since he'd left Eos, Klindar had walked on 30 worlds and devoted at least 10 years of his life to each. On two he had suffered minor deaths, but this was one of the inevitable hazards of exploration. He expected to die many times again before he returned to his native world. Now a thousand light years away in normal space. As long as his body was not totally destroyed, the doctors could always repair it. If only we were so lucky, eh? We human beings, we get killed by a strong gust of wind. Um, okay, and uh, he debunks, there's a conspiracy theory that how stands is a, represent, a reference to IBM, because it's one letter of IBM, ahead of IBM, so H I. A, B, L, M, um, but no, he, he explains at, in the novel that HAL stands for uh, Heuristically Programmed Algorithmic Computer. He says, no, I'm not going to explain that except to say that it gets the best of both worlds in computer design. And this little line here, this is actually uh, referenced in uh, the foreword, I think, or the postscript, one of the books, I've mentioned it before. He says, I've never quite forgiven Bill Anders for resisting the temptation, which he later admitted had passed through his mind, of radioing back to Earth the discovery of a large black monolith on the far side of the moon. That being the astronaut the first time we, we went round to the far side. Um, we get the, the, the Three Laws of Robotics by Isaac Asimov, which is cool because obviously Asimov was a, was a pal of Clark's as well. So we get a few bits on this page. Uh, Bruno says, eating food is a terribly inefficient and messy way of acquiring energy. Some of my friends in biotechnology are trying to bypass it. And the re response is, thanks for warning us, that's one project we won't support. I prefer the human body the way it is. And while we're on the subject, we do have another fundamental advantage over robots. And what's that? We can be manufactured by unskilled labor. And then later on, he ends the chapter by saying, Yes, it was true that for a while men would be able to outbreed robots, but far more important was the fact that one day robots would outthink men. When that day came, Bruno hoped that they would still be on good terms with their creators. And we're kind of getting towards that point now with our, you know, modern artificial intelligence. And um, there's a little bit about, about 
uh, life on, on Mercury. And uh, he's put a footnote here, which I think is interesting. Uh, Asimov's done this as well, where he's mentioned and called himself out where science has progressed, you know, past the point of, uh, like, his science has debunked what uh, his novel says, basically. So he wrote, while these words were being written, radio observers were discovering, to the embarrassed amazement of the astronomers, that Mercury does not keep the same face always turned toward the sun. This wiped out a whole category of science fiction stories overnight, but makes very little difference to surface conditions on the planet. I think the one that I read with Asimov, um, he'd got oceans on Venus, and it turns out Venus does not have oceans, which, you know. And then we get Jack Kimball, he's having sex with Irene uh, Martinson. So I'm going to read out the little passage here. Don't worry, it's not too dirty. The ribald speculations which had grown with the space age were not altogether ill-founded. In the total absence of weight, some of the more exuberant fantasies of Indian temple art had moved into the realm of practical politics. One did not have to be an athlete to surpass anything that the ingenious sculptures of the great Konorak temple at Pori had been able to contrive. And it was an interesting fact, which the psychologists had not overlooked, that reproductions of such art were rather popular in all the larger, permanently inhabited space stations. And um, so we get some reaction from Earth when they find out that there is intelligent life out there. And there's some thought about um, we might be able to defend ourselves with nukes. Um, we have absolute supremacy over a wasp's nest, one general explained, but unless we have a damn good reason, we'll leave it alone. And the thought is the aliens would be the same, even though they would be way more technologically advanced than us, it just wouldn't be worth their hassle. Um, and then we get these two lines here, these two sentences, which I think are pretty good. So, though this was mildly reassuring, most pessimists felt the problem would not be that they were invulnerable to a nuclear explosion, but that our delivery systems might be like Brazilian headhunters trying to spear low-flying supersonic aircraft. The optimists refused to believe that an advanced extraterrestrial society would behave in a hostile manner. They felt that the fantastic knowledge of three million years must bring an equivalent advance in ethics and morality, or else, it was argued, any society would eventually destroy itself. But I mean, our society is kind of eventually destroying itself, you know what I mean? Shocking, and probably based on reality. The last survey was rather depressing. Even now, 23% of the public thinks that the sun is nearer than the moon, that there are only a few thousand stars, and that they're not very big anyway. You get this little footnote, hopefully by 2001, even the UK and the US will have joined the civilised world and adopted the metric system. Well, the UK is probably slightly further ahead than the US on that, but we still use miles. So how many suns would you guess that the whole galaxy contains? If you said a few million, you would be hopelessly in error. A few billion would be better. There are in fact about a hundred billion stars in the galaxy. Every one of those a sun. 30 of them to every man, woman and child now alive. That just shows you how big space is. I'm actually scared by how big space is. And Dr. Brailsford says, I'm not a pessimist, just a realist who knows that only a tiny fraction of the species that have lived on this planet have any descendants today. Um, I would consider myself that. I'm, I'm kind of consider myself a pessimistic realist. I like this description of uh, Whitehead. There were some who claimed that he had paranormal powers, for whereas most engineers had to kick their black boxes when they misbehaved, Whitehead merely had to glare at them. So we've got the uh, chapter here, Final Orbit. This is um, a chapter that would have been in an earlier draft of the book. Um, and I just like the way that they're approaching this and how they're trying to make contact with this alien intelligence. This was the situation classified in the mission profile as evidence of intelligent life, no sign of activity, and the response had been outlined in detail. They would do nothing for 10 days except transmit the prime numbers, 1, 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, at intervals of two minutes, over a broad band of the radio spectrum. We get a chapter with a great name, something is seriously wrong with space. And Kaminsky says this, A long time ago, I came across a remark that I've never forgotten, though I can't remember who made it. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And what's cool is that it was Arthur C. Clarke who made it. Uh, he actually calls it Clarke's third law, and he says, Oh, very well, the first. When a distinguished but elderly scientist says that something is possible, he is almost certainly right. When he says it is impossible, he is very probably wrong. The second, the only way of finding the limits of the possible is by going beyond them into the impossible. He notes, I decided that if three laws were good enough for Newton, they were good enough for me. And here we get a little bit of uh, his approach or his attitude towards drugs, which I thought was interesting as I am now straight edge. I don't drink, uh, I don't smoke, I do vape, but 0% nicotine, don't do drugs drink a lot of energy drinks. But anyway, he says, I raise this subject because some interested parties have tried to claim 2001 for their own. Once, at a science fiction convention, an unknown admirer thrust a packet into my hand. On opening, it turned out to contain some powder and an anonymous note of thanks, assuring me that this was the best stuff. I promptly flushed it down the toilet. 
Now, I do not know enough about drugs to have very strong views on the matter, and I'm only mildly in favour of the death penalty, even for tobacco peddling. But it seems to me that consciousness-expanding chemicals do exactly the opposite. What they really expand are uncriticalness, crazy man, and general euphoria, which may be fine for personal relationships, but is the death of real art, except possibly in restricted areas of music and poetry. Strong words. Right at the end of it we get this little bit. He found himself repeating desperately like an incantation to ward off disaster. Child Harold to the Dark Tower came. Then the Dark Tower was upon him. And his only regret and his <laughs> and his only regret was that he had seen so much and learned so little. Um, isn't it Child Roland to the Dark Tower came? Because that's the whole point of the character Roland in the Dark Tower in the Stephen King books. And uh, so in this version of the story. Bowman finds this kind of alien civilization or whatever and um, I like this this contrasts their civilization with ours uh, Another proof of that lay in the spaciousness of the city There was none of the hideous urban overcrowding so universal on earth that also was not surprising for any really long-lived Civilization had to have complete population control It must have been thousands of years since these creatures had stabilized their society and decided that it was better for a million to live in comfort than for 10 million to starve in squalor that was a lesson that his own world had been slow to learn. So yeah, all in all, The Lost Worlds of 2001 by Arthur C. Clarke. Fascinating stuff. I actually probably enjoyed it more than the novels, you know. Um, the fiction elements of it were fun. It was nice to see the alternate bits. But really what I really enjoyed was the stuff about, you know, how the book came about. Uh, little The journal entries were fascinating. The stuff about, like, the relationship between him and Kubrick was really good as well. So overall, I gave The Lost Worlds of 2001 a 4 out of 5. So there we have it, that's what I made of The Lost Worlds of 2001 by Arthur C. Clarke. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye